Hello, and thanks for stopping by. The 4th of December 2022 was a sad day for London, for it saw the closure of the Museum of London, an institution which has sat on the southwestern corner of the Barbican complex since 1976. The building, which in line with the rest of the Barbican is an example of brutalist architecture, was designed by Philip Powell and Hidalgo Mayer, and was planned in such a way that visitors were directed along a specific route. In other words, taken on a chronological journey through London's history, rather than being left to wander aimlessly around the collection of random cabinets. Fortunately, the museum will be reopening in a few years' time. It's moving a short distance to West Smithfield, where it will occupy a number of renovated Victorian market buildings. It will be changing its name slightly too. In the future, it will be known as the London Museum. One of the most intriguing aspects of the new London Museum is that it will be the only museum in the world to have a railway running through it. This is because, at the lower level, the tracks carrying Thameslink trains between King's Cross and Blackfriars pass close by, and so a window will be installed, thus enabling the opportunity for commuters and museum visitors to gawp at each other. As for the old 1970s buildings, well, at the time of making this video, their fate seems a little uncertain. Initially, they were scheduled to make way for a bizarrely shaped concert hall, although the pandemic put an end to that plan. It would now seem that there were plans to demolish the old museum and replace it with a new office complex. Anyway, just before the Museum of London closed for good, I decided to go and have one last look around, for old times sake. And in this video, I'd like to show you some of my favourite displays. So, let's go. If we're being honest, the Museum of London was never the easiest place to find. It was perched above ground, meaning visitors had to either navigate lengthy twisting walkways through the Barbican, or try to locate one of the ground level entrances, which were tucked away around the end of London Wall, where, by the way, these charming illustrations of Dick Whittington and his cats could be seen. Also at ground level was one of the museum's most recognisable features, this huge brick rotunda, which acts as a roundabout connecting London Wall, Aldersgate Street and Little Britain. London cabbies came to nickname this structure the Wall of Death, most probably because it resembles the kind of tall wooden velodrome which stunt riders race motorbikes around. However, there is more truth to this nickname than people may realise, for the rotunda is essentially a mausoleum, a well of souls if you will, because deep within there lies a storage facility in which thousands of bones excavated from spitter fields are carefully packed away. The centre of the rotunda also contains this pleasant garden, which does a good job of concealing its grim archive. We'll have a look inside the Museum of London itself in just a moment, but before we do, I'd like to introduce you to this video's sponsor, My Heritage. As you can probably tell, I adore history, especially when it has a social angle, and I found that exploring your own ancestry is a wonderful and often very moving way of connecting with the past. My Heritage makes this process both fun and easy. You begin by building your family tree. Here's mine. It's still a work in progress, but as My Heritage offers access to over 18 billion records, it's sure to grow pretty fast. As Europe's number one family history service, My Heritage is trusted by 90 million users. That's a lot of people, so it's a safe bet that you'll find someone out there that you had no idea existed. I've already found myself falling down several rabbit holes, and that's because the level of detail available is breathtaking. The collection catalogue, for example, contains several thousand databases from across the world, covering everything from birth, marriage and death directories, to censuses and military records. This particular database, for example, lists passengers who travelled between Ireland and New York in the mid-19th century. My surname's Lorden, which comes from Cork in Ireland, so type that in and a few matches flash up. Mary Lorden? John Lorden? I wonder where this could lead. Furthermore, My Heritage features some incredible photo enhancement tools. Let's try them out with this image. This gentleman is Harry Hewish, an ancestor of mine who fought in the Great War. 
That crease in the corner has always annoyed me. It's been there as long as I've known this photo. So let's use the repair tool to smooth it out. And now let's use the enhance button to sharpen things up. And finally, let's add a bit of color. Pretty incredible, isn't it? You can bring old photos to life even further by animating them. Here's a group of my grandfather's friends taken in a pub somewhere in Kilburn in the 1950s. Now watch this. You can enjoy all of these incredible features by signing up to MyHeritage for a 14 day free trial. And if you decide to continue your subscription, you'll get a 50% discount. Furthermore, make sure you don't miss out on the chance to get a DNA kit, which MyHeritage are currently offering at their lowest ever price, along with the chance to test out their new AI time machine, which allows you to see yourself as a historical figure. You'll find the link to MyHeritage in the description below. Thanks for watching. Now, let's go and see what treasures we can find in the old Museum of London. The first gallery in the museum was London Before London, which, as the name suggests, featured artefacts which are tens of thousands of years old. This bony foot, for example, once belonged to a straight-tusked elephant, a now extinct species which once roamed around these parts during the Stone Age. It was unearthed just outside London, in the town of Avely in Essex. This is the skull of a woolly rhinoceros. It was found beneath what's now Salisbury Square, just south of Fleet Street. And this human skull, with evidence of a rather nasty injury, was found in Hammersmith. These remnants of a skeleton were discovered beneath a farm in Shepperton in 1989. They're believed to have belonged to a woman aged between 30 and 40, who lived sometime around 3100 BC. Using her skull, a reconstruction of her likeness has been made. Other evidence of humans living on the land that would become London include this bronze shield, which is approximately 2,800 years old, and this large tankard, which dates from around 100 BC. London, or Londinium as it was first known, was established by the Romans in around 47 AD during the reign of the Emperor Claudius and the Museum of London had a very fine gallery devoted to the Roman period, which lasted for around 400 years. A number of detailed models give an idea of how the Roman settlement would have appeared. This is the first London Bridge for example, with an accompanying wharf, constructed shortly after the Romans arrived. And here's the Forum, essentially the town square, which was located around the spot now occupied by Leadenhall Market. This model is of the public baths, which were built on what's now Upper Thames Street in around AD 70 to 90. They were refurbished in AD 120, and this decorated slab of wall once formed part of that facility. There are some bathing implements to be seen too. This comb, believed to have been designed for rooting out head lice, was found on Borough High Street. The bronze head above it, which is of Minerva, once formed the handle of a razor. These tools, known as strigils, would have been used by bathers to scrape sweat, dirt and cleansing oil from the skin. They were found in the River Woolbrook, a stream which once ran above ground from Shoreditch through the city of London and out into the Thames. Also found in the Woolbrook was this skull, one of many, which is believed to have belonged to an unfortunate person who was decapitated during Queen Boudicca's ferocious revolt. The rebellion, which occurred in AD 60, during the brutal reign of the Emperor Nero, and just 13 years after Londinium had been established, involved Boudicca's followers burning their settlements to the ground, as evidenced by this scorched debris and a collection of fire damaged coins. Like many cities across the Roman Empire, Londinium had an amphitheatre where locals could watch all manner of savage blood sports. 
This arena, which wasn't discovered until 1988, was sited beneath what's now the Guildhall. You can see its remains in the basement of the Guildhall Gallery. This iron trident, which was found on Stony Street near Borough Market, was most likely used by a gladiator, the type known as a Retiarius, who fought with the trident, dagger and net. And here's a small figure of a gladiator, something I like to think is an ancient version of a child's action figure. One aspect, which is sure to be missed from the old Museum of London, is this view of a section of London wall, which rather fittingly could be viewed from the Roman gallery. One of my favourite items in the Roman section was this building tile which is found on Warwick Lane. Some 2000 years ago, a worker scratched a note on it, which reads, For the last 13 days, Austerlis has been wandering off on his own every day. What do you think Austerlis was up to? Maybe he was liaising with a lover, or perhaps there was a tavern nearby. Please let me know your theories in the comments. A similar quirky echo of the past is this tile, which, going by the paw print, appears to have been trod upon by a dog whilst the clay was still wet. One of the most intriguing Roman sites to be discovered in London is the Temple of Mithras, which was uncovered between Cannon Street and Queen Victoria Street in the 1950s. Mithraism was essentially a secret society, an excuse to feast and get drunk, and was especially popular amongst Roman soldiers. This is the head of Mithras, which is found in the remains of the temple, as was this sculpture of Bacchus, the god of wine. You can visit the Temple of Mithras today, and it's a site which I'd highly recommend. I'll leave a link with the details below. After the Romans abandoned London, other groups, such as the Anglo-Saxons, began to muscle in. These were violent times, as this long fighting life, which dates from around 600 to 700 AD, demonstrates. It was found in Stratford in East London. The biggest event to shake the medieval era was the murder of Thomas Becket, a much admired politician and Archbishop of Canterbury, who was born on Cheapside in London and famously slain within Canterbury Cathedral on December 29, 1170. Following his assassination, Becket was made a saint and a cult grew around his legacy. It became common for groups of people to walk from London to Canterbury as a means of making a pilgrimage to his shrine. When they did, many such pilgrims would purchase a badge in Canterbury as a souvenir of their trick, several examples of which are shown here. It will probably come as no surprise to hear that it was Henry VIII who put an end to the veneration of Thomas Becket, and this beautiful gold chalice, known as the Grace Cup, has a connection with that tyrannical king. He presented it to the Guild of Barber Surgeons in 1543, who were essentially the doctors of their day, and in doing so, the king granted them the right to improve their medical knowledge by allowing them to dissect four executed criminals per year. This type of incredibly pointy shoe, which appears to be the style favoured by the first incarnation of Edmund Blackadder, was very fashionable in London during the 1400s. The authorities were not impressed though, and in 1465, a law was passed forbidding beaks or pikes over two inches long on footwear, upon pain of cursing by the clergy and a fine of 20 shillings. This grand model depicts the old St Paul's Cathedral, the wooden structure which took some 200 years to build. Believe it or not, this version of St Paul's was bigger than the present incarnation. It was longer, wider and even taller, although the spire was destroyed by lightning in 1561. The entire cathedral was finally destroyed during the Great Fire of London, and this model was made for the White City exhibition which was held near Shepherd's Bush in 1908. The 
The 1600s were a turbulent time for the city, marked by a civil war, plague, and of course the Great Fight of London. And there were some fascinating objects related to this era in the museum. This is Oliver Cromwell's death mask. And this is believed to have been his own personal copy of the Bible. Cromwell was a Puritan, and following his victory in the Civil War, he banned pretty much anything that was fun, including sports and Christmas. Theatres were closed down too, including the Globe, which had been established by William Shakespeare. Here's a model of that famous theatre, or as the Bard called it, this wooden O. When Cromwell died in 1658, the nation breathed a sigh of relief and decided that it had enough of Puritanism, and so they invited Charles II to come out of exile and establish himself as king. This grand book commemorates his coronation, as do these souvenir cups. The Great Plague broke out in London in 1665 and is believed to have claimed the lives of some 100,000 people, which would have been a quarter of the city's population at the time. This vicious looking syringe and set of needles were used during the plague to drain the hideous buboes which infested those suffering from the terrible disease. These little pots, meanwhile, would have contained a substance known as London treacle, which, amongst other things, contained oil and gunpowder. It was made under license, and people would rub it in their nostrils in the hope of warding off the plague. I'm not sure how effective it was, though. The plague was wiped out by the Great Fire of London, which broke out at a bakery on Pudding Lane in early September 1666. This is an example of an oven from that period, and may well have been similar to the one which was responsible for the blaze. The Great Fire raged for five days. This Bible displays burn marks from the flames. As do these tiles, bricks, and children's shoes. Firefighting equipment was of course very basic in the 1660s. These two fire buckets are from that era, as is this fireman's helmet. This larger object is an early fire engine, one of a number which were built in the wake of 1666. It could be hauled around on wheels and was capable of pumping water out, although it had to be constantly topped up with buckets. The famous chronicler of this period was Samuel Pepys, who kept a diary detailing the plague and fire. This silver plate, complete with scratch marks made by cutlery, belonged to the great man. The Museum of London classed the modern era as beginning around 300 years ago, which, considering the city is some 2,000 years old, could indeed be considered relatively recent, I suppose. This fellow is known as Gerard the Giant. Carved in 1670, he used to be displayed outside a tavern known as Gerard's Hall, which stood on Basing Lane, and was a reference to a legend that claimed a giant once lived on the site. One of the most intriguing, if not gruesome items here, is this Bill of Mortality, a leaflet which used to be published every week in London as a means of detailing the number of deaths that has occurred over the past few days, and how each person had passed away. This particular bill lists the causes of death from between the 1st and the 8th of February 1675. Some of the fatalities are straightforward enough, such as old age, fever and scurvy, but other examples include wind, worms, griping in the guts, and, um, teeth. I tried to think what dying in such a manner would entail. The bill also mentions that one man was shot dead with a musket in St. Boltolf's Old Gate, and that another man shot himself, accidentally, according to this, with a pistol at St. Martin in the Fields. Several other people seem to have died on building sites after falling to their deaths. The unfortunate men who suffered such workplace accidents may very well have used tools such as these. And here's another interesting item related to construction. 
It's a document detailing the purchase of Portland Stone for the rebuilding of St Paul's Cathedral. 50,000 tons of the stuff, all quarried in Dorset, were required for the project. Another major construction scheme for London was the Thames Tunnel, which, after many difficult years, opened in 1843. It had been overseen by Mark Brunel, whose son, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, also worked on the project. Here's a fun telescopic view of the Thames Tunnel. I'm sure there are many hours of fun to be had with it. Similar is his view of the Great Exhibition, which was held at Hyde Park in 1851 in the huge Crystal Palace building. And here's a model of the venue, which appears to have been put together from a kit. The Great Exhibition showcased arts and crafts from around the world, and indeed London itself was noted for the high quality goods it produced in the 18th and 19th centuries. This gorgeous musical clock, for example, was manufactured in around 1760 by George Pike, whose workshop was on Bedford Row. More lethal, but just as ornate, are these duelling pistols. London was known for the quality of its guns, and many gun makers worked in what's now the East End, Stepney, Whitechapel, and around the Tower of London. This particular set of pistols dates from 1810, and were owned by Captain Thomas Davies of the Hackney Volunteer Riflemen, a militia force who had been formed to protect the city from potential French invasion. Fans were a popular and fashionable item to have too, and they were often created to commemorate certain events. This one, for instance, marks the ascent of two hot air balloons, which occurred simultaneously in London and Paris in 1783. As lovely as these items are, it mustn't be forgotten that London had a very dark side in those days too. Prisons, for example, were exceptionally brutal. These irons were used at Newgate, and this grim and very heavy door is from the same dreaded jail. Being locked behind this would have certainly drained one's spirits. These preserved walls, meanwhile, once formed a cell at Well Close Prison, which was located in East London, near Wapping. If you look closely, you'll see they are covered in graffiti, including people's names, dates, drawings, and pitiful laments. Given the general level of medical knowledge, falling ill in those days was a pretty terrifying prospect too. Here's a set of surgeon's tools, for example. Imagine being subjected to these without anaesthetic. Elsewhere, there's this tiny yet heartbreaking artifact. It's a little doll dating from 1852, and it was given one night to a sickly eight-year-old girl named Letitia Hawkins, who died the very next day, most probably from either measles or whooping cough. Moving into the 20th century, we have this beautiful London taxi. Although it's very basic, just look at the dashboard, or lack of it. It was first licensed in 1908, and as you can see, it was very open to the elements. This Art Deco sign for the Savoy Grill was installed in 1929, and was designed to attract wealthy American visitors, whilst this beautiful 1920s lift car was once used in Selfridges. In the 1920s, the American owner of the department store, Harry Selfridge, employed women to operate his elevators, which was quite a novelty for the time. Having said that, it mustn't be forgotten that women filled many male roles during the First World War. This uniform, for example, was worn by a female bus conductor during that era. During World War I, London was targeted in bombing raids on numerous occasions, first by the giant Zeppelin airships, and later by faster Gotha bombers. This bomb casing is from one such attack. It's landed on a tea warehouse in 1915. Similar are these objects from World War II. They're German incendiary devices, which were designed to ignite and spread fire. On the 29th of December, 1940, thousands of these incendiaries were dropped on London, creating an almighty blaze, which came to be dubbed the Second Great Fire of London. 
It was that night that this famous photograph of St Paul's Cathedral, standing defiant amongst the smoke, was taken. This object is a detonator, which is in a bomb that hits St Paul's, although mercifully, it didn't explode. Moving on to more recent times, these are touristy knickknacks from the 1960s and 70s. And these chunky mobile phones would have been brandished by city workers in the 1980s and 90s. There's this board too, which belonged to Stanley Green, the so-called protein man who patrolled Oxford Street every day between 1968 and 1993. It was a bit strange to see this final cabinet, which showcased items from the 2012 Olympics. After all, 2012 feels like it was only yesterday. But that's the way it goes, I suppose. Time moves on. And let's hope the new museum, when it finally opens at Smithfield, proves a success. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this tour around the old Museum of London. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the museum. Did you get the chance to visit it when it was open? If so, what were your favourite exhibits? And how do you think the museum will fare when it reopens at the new Smithfield site? Please be sure to let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video and haven't done so already, then I'd really appreciate it if you could please consider subscribing to my channel as this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive notifications, will ensure you don't miss out whenever I publish a new Rob's London episode. And it goes without saying, of course, that it'd be great to have you along. If you're feeling extra generous, you can also support me via my Kofi page, or alternatively, by using the YouTube Thanks button, which appears below the video as a heart icon. Any donations are, of course, greatly appreciated, and play a big part in helping me make videos. If you're interested in merchandise, I have an Etsy store too, Rob's Online Designs, where you'll find an array of hand illustrated mugs, featuring designs of tube trains, taxis, buses and so on. I'll leave a link to that, along with my Kofi page, in the description. For now though, thanks again friends, stay well and please be sure to stay tuned. <laughs>